Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome to the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Everyone, how you doing? Welcome into the program. Today on the show, we of course have computer and technology news and we'll be doing that for the whole hour. Uh, everyone, ComputerAmerica.com, always have to plug that in, as well as uh, our social media. You can find us in everything that we do with Computer America at ComputerAmerica.com and of course, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, all that good stuff. Uh, check it out. So, I think with that being said, I hope everyone out there had a fantastic weekend and you are ready for the show today. So, uh, yeah, why don't we go ahead and get started? We have a ton of different stories and, uh, yeah, some very fun ones. Let's go ahead and get started. Computer and technology news brought to you by Computer America. Here we go. Okay, so our first story that we're going to do is going to be NFTs yet again. I am kind of uh, weirded out how uh, you know how uh, ready everyone seemed to be for NFTs and how uh, they've really seemed to have you know caught the attention of a lot of people and seemingly a lot of people with a lot of money. Uh, take this for instance, Jack Dorsey. He is the uh, he is of course the founder of Twitter. If you uh, don't recall the name, yeah, his very first tweet that he sent. Somehow they managed to package it into an NFT, a non fungible token, which is of course a way of saying this is my digital good. It can be copied, it can be pasted, it can be distributed a billion times over. But I have the original. I have the only original tweet that started the whole platform and it sold for a whopping total of not just 3 million but 2,915,835.47 yeah the change was super important on that one but here we have it after spent just over 2 weeks on the market Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey has sold his first tweet as an NFT for the amount said before. Uh, the winning bid was Sinan Astavi, <coughs> sorry, uh, Sinan Astavi, who held the high bid since offering $2.5 million on March 6th. He upped his bid to this number at the last moment, and if anyone can tell us what the figure represents, and of course that's the author asking why 291583547, uh, yeah, Dorsey put the tweet up for auction as an NFT. And, of course, that lives in the Ethereum blockchain. Bids were handled on a platform called Cent, which, by the way, C-E-N-T, that lets people make offers um, on tweets that are autographed by their original creator. So you can imagine some of the uh, super popular tweets. You know, of course, uh, the uh, you know the former president of the United States, love him or hate him, Donald Trump. Um, I'm sure that there's a number of tweets that a lot of people would uh, want to have signed and owned. He's saying, this is my tweet. Uh, you know, Barack Obama, you know, political figures, uh, you know, very, very famous people. Uh, maybe the tweet that had the most shares, likes, and retweets, things like that. Uh, being able to own that little piece of history, I guess, is very, very attractive because, you know, hey, it did have an impact on culture. It's just, what you know, what is that really worth, though? And that seems to be the question that everyone is asking. 
So, uh, the bids on the first tweet saying, uh, just set up my Twitter. And by the way, he abbreviated because I guess, you know, he's uh, the founder and the very first. And yeah, March, uh, March 21st, 2006, 3.50 p.m. And again, it was just setting up my TWTTR, short for Twitter. Not got all the vowels. And according to the timestamp, of course, uh, uh, I'm sorry, according to the timestamp on Sense, Estavi made his final winning bid on Monday afternoon and paid it using the, the Ether cryptocurrency for the amounts of about 1,630 Ether. Well, I'm sorry, Ethereum. Well, you know, Ether for short. Uh, Estavi, CEO of, uh, CEO of blockchain company Bridge Oracle, told him he uh, told Reuters he was thankful. So you can imagine this was also some level of self-promotion, uh, you know, being that he is the CEO of a blockchain company. You know, he believes in, in his product and he believes in the technology. So, yeah, he's going to do something crazy. Now, with that being said, Dorsey said that the pre uh, said previously he would convert the winning bid into Bitcoin and donate it to give directly for uh, its Africa response. And he tweeted the receipt. So, of course, you can see there. Uh, as well, he donated uh, the equivalent of about 50 Bitcoin. So there you go. Uh, auction winners on Send got a uh, get a digital certificate of the tweet and their purchase, which is unique because it has been signed and verified by the creator. Uh, Dorsey received 95% of the sale price, and Send gets 5%. It's a uh, it's pretty crazy that NFTs and you know now we can uh, in retrospect go back, you know, things that we assumed were very, uh, intangible things, you know, uh, uh, pictures, movies, memes, um, uh, you know, things that went viral, uh, the first, the last, uh, you know, yeah, they're stored in archives and they are, uh, accessible through, let's say things like the Wayback machine and so on and so forth, but things that were intangible to begin with, uh, Looks like they're becoming uh, actual sellable goods, and that has never really happened before. Uh, yeah, Im Im imagine being able to be the one to say that I own, you know, the video footage that is currently in the, uh, you know, being displayed by, uh, you know, the National Museum or, you know, so on and so forth. Being able to lay claim on the only, the first, the one, the official owner of something that everyone has, uh, I'm still very, very skeptical on if that actually matters. But it seems like other people are not as skeptical and they're willing to, yeah, spend the money and uh, really appreciate their digital goods as they see fit. So there you have it. Okay, that was story number one. Again, uh, the first tweet ever sent, and uh, at least the first tweet uh, by the Twitter CEO, um, sells for just under $3 million. Pretty crazy. So, story number one, story number two. Let's uh, let's go ahead and get into something else. Okay, SpaceX, we talk about uh, on the show a lot. They're, you know, hey, when it comes to space race, space is cool. Rockets are cool. Uh, the whole thing, very, very cool. Well, looks like someone doesn't agree as much, and that person is the entirety of Europe. Not so much the people, but the council that oversees the whole European Union is uh, a little uh, worried that there is a dominance of SpaceX in the, uh, you know, really in the space industry, not just commercial, but otherwise. And of course, the Falcon 9 has come to dominate commercial satellite launches. So, let's go ahead and get into this article from Ars Technica, Mr. Eric Berger. A little more than a week ago, the European Space Agency announced an initiative to, uh, to study future space transportation solutions. Uh, and basically, the agency provided about $60,000 each to three companies to study competitive systems from 2030 and onwards. They mentioned that the initiative would allow Europe to understand and prepare for the future of space launch. So essentially, they handed out money and say, figure out what's going to happen, and then we'll move on from there. Now, with that being said, uh, they said that, uh, 
Uh, the implication is that Europe's next generation of rockets, and that includes the larger Ari uh, the Ariane 6 booster and smaller Vega C, will meet the continent's launch needs for the next decade. Now, of course, what happens after 2030, that's what, again, they're trying to find out. Now, uh, they said that uh, there now appears to be increasing concerns in Europe about, well, uh, SpaceX. And that these rockets that they had thought previously were going to be super competitive, well, not as competitive as once thought. So, uh, they said that, uh, let's see, going on here, uh, this is important because they will, uh, they, that while the member states of the European Space Agency pay for development of the rockets, after reaching operational status, these launch programs are expected are expected to become self-sufficient by attracting commercial satellite launches. So obviously being able to uh, pay the bills is super important when it comes to, uh, you know, these things, because, Hey, you know, it's uh, probably much harder to get funding. If you're saying that for the next 15, 20 years, we will be paying constantly for these. Uh, and of course with uh, SpaceX being able to, and really, you know, the, the cost saving when it comes to SpaceX, because, you know, these, uh, these other rockets, you, you know, they have to look at them and say, well, you're paying for the entirety of the rocket. None of it is salvageable. Like it's not just the fuel, uh, you have to pay for the fuel, all the hardware, everything that went into it. And then of course you have to pay for your payload to actually be on it. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And of course, when you compare that to, let's say, a SpaceX launch that's able to recover, you know, stage one, stage two boosters, uh, yeah, you know, they may only, you know, charge you a nominal fee, but they're not going to charge you the entirety of the rocket every single time. Completely blows uh, your, you know, uh, the European Space Agency out of the water. And, you know, hey, with, uh, with a lot of trial and error, I might add, SpaceX has been able to do that. So they say that uh, as the newspaper reports, Europe now lags behind SpaceX in other key ways. Because of the partnership with NASA, SpaceX can now launch astronauts. French astronauts, uh, in fact, uh, they mentioned one of the astronauts in France, uh, is a mission specialist on the Crew 2 mission due to launch next month. So they're even launching... Uh, European astronauts into space using SpaceX. Uh, he will likely be the first of many European astronauts to reach space on a SpaceX vehicle. Europe also presently has no answer to the Starlink uh, to the Starlink Mega constellation that they are in the middle of launching. And by the way, if you ever want to check out some of those uh, some of those uh, images where they track the uh, debris in space. The those calling the mega constellations is uh, very appropriate. They're really incredible. Now, because of all this, the French and the Italian ministers are calling for Europe to offer a significant technological and industrial response to the rise of SpaceX. Moreover, any initiative will be complicated by politics. Obviously, they have their space program rooted uh, in France. And, uh, of course, the Vega in Italy. Germany, with no history of its own rockets during the, Euro the European Union era, uh, era, which, for good reason, you know, German rockets didn't go too well. They said that, um, uh, they said that nonetheless has several promising small launch companies, including Rocket Factory uh, Augsburg, and it may seek to foster private competition rather than support another international approach. Uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, it, and really it's it's it goes to highlight. You know, we we look at what happens with uh, SpaceX, and you know, their rocket falls over. They're you know doing that kind of thing. Uh, you know, it, it lands, but then it catches fire, and then it explodes. It uh, it lands on a ship, but then it doesn't land on the ship, and one of the legs gives out, and the whole thing falls over. All of those culminate into this idea that you can salvage, save, and reuse the rockets, and every other company and country, especially on a national level, every other country and company in the world is looking at that and going, we have no idea how to do that. We are not capable of doing that. And we need 
to do that because as soon as one person does, you know, it's, uh, it only makes sense. It only makes sense to make uh, the whole space thing actually viable. So good on SpaceX for fostering competition. Uh, whether or not the European Union or Germany or anyone else can really uh, rival them, that remains to be seen. But hey, uh, it looks like satellites are actually super important to our world. So uh, as as awesome as SpaceX is doing, I'm sure that there's plenty of uh, you know plenty of demand for a very limited supply. Or very limited supply of uh, rockets. So, but there you go. SpaceX actually making waves. That's just what the company wanted to do. How about we go ahead and talk about something that you know? Hey, if you own a MacBook Air and a MacBook, uh, you probably already know this. This was an issue. Uh, this was a corner cut. This was a cheap fix and something that didn't really need to happen. The innovative, amazing, wonderful butterfly keyboard switches that Apple was using in its thinner keyboards. So to reduce space, instead of the traditional mechanical keyboard, they had these weird scissor-like butterfly switches in, in their MacBooks to save you know that fraction of an inch. Uh, but the biggest problem you can have is, of course it being an inferior product, which a judge just certified that it was. I hope all of you out there kept your receipts. Saying that angry MacBook owners get a class action status for butterfly keyboard suit. There you go. Uh, Yeah, so a judge has certified a class action suit against Apple for its fragile butterfly keyboard design. Uh, and this includes in several uh, several states, California, New York, Florida, Illinois, New Jersey, Washington, and Michigan. And that includes people who bought a MacBook model between 2015 and 2017 and a MacBook Pro model between 2016 and 2019. And then, of course, MacBook Air between 2018 and 2019. This case has a pretty good chance of being uh, settled or, you know, actually reaching a conclusion because it happened so long. It affected so many people. And, you know, it was publicized a lot that these uh, this style of keyboard was just not good. And one of the, uh, you know, one of the best ways to kind of say, oh, yeah, that totally happened was that, hey, they moved away from the butterfly uh, uh, style of switches to something much, much better. So they said, and of course, for those who don't recall, the butterfly keyboard was slimmer than Apple's previous design. And of course, those were, so they had scissor switches and then they switched to butterfly switches. And of course, so you can imagine things like a butterfly, you know, uh, the little body in the middle, the, uh, the wings that fold out. So instead of having that kind of springy feel to them, uh, no, it would rely on kind of the tension of uh, those two kind of pushing up as opposed to the tension of, you know, the two working against each other. It was, uh, it definitely saved space, but it wasn't good. Now, they said that the revamp keyboard failed uh, when even tiny particles of dust accumulated under the switches and the result in keys that felt sticky failed to register key presses or registered multiple presses on a single hit. You can imagine that, you know, dust is a pretty common thing and it should be totally acceptable that dust gets in your keyboard. Apple tweaked its butterfly keyboard multiple times, but but after continued complaints, abandoned the switches in 2020. The suit claims that Apple knew for years that the switches were defective and it cites internal communications inside Apple, including an executive who wrote that no matter how much lipstick you try to put on this pig, it's still ugly. So looks like they were able to get uh, some of those internal communications that said this. I, it's, it's, it's a complaint that people have had about Apple forever, is that they make product decisions and they don't turn back on them. The product decisions are, 
you know, uh, questionable at best, like removing the floppy drive, removing the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, um, you know, going to Thunderbolt instead of USB or, uh, or Firewire and all that kind of thing. Apple and their designers feel like they know best. And anyone who is going to, um, you know, kind of uh, be against that, well, Apple's not going to admit to it. And I think this is a lawsuit of the exact same nature. Now, the plaintiffs accuse Apple of violating several laws, and they mentioned the California's unfair competition law, the Florida Deceptive and Unfair Trade Practices Act, and Michigan's Consumer Protection Act. Uh, they aren't asking for nationwide certification at this time, but they, uh, they've invited any U.S. buyer of an affected MacBook to complete a survey. So buried down here, uh, yeah, uh, buried down here in the article, there's a link right here to the actual survey, and uh, yeah, you can be potentially included in this class action. This is probably years in the making. It's it's not going to happen overnight, but still. Uh, Apple argued against the class action, obviously, saying that they weren't guilty, saying one, uh, one consolidated suit shouldn't cover multiple tweaks to the butterfly keyboard, but the plaintiffs successfully argued that the butterfly keyboards may have some fundamental problems due to their shallow design, the narrow gaps between the keys, and none of the differences that Apple points to change uh, spaces between the keys, nor the low travel aspect of the design. Apple was trying to slim down their notebooks and, you know, just like their MacBook Airs, say, hey, this is the thinnest, most powerful laptop. That was their sale. Uh, you know, that, that was their pitch. And to accomplish that, they had to compromise on, I guess, kind of the durability. Uh, so, yeah, this one seems pretty cut and dry. Uh, what the actual damages are and who's going to actually receive them, uh, who the heck knows. But I'm sure that anyone who participates in the class action will not feel vindicated. So, there's at least that. Uh, okay, now, uh, there's story number three. We can go ahead and on into story number four. And looking at all the different uh, all the different ones here, let's talk about AT and T. And I have a feeling I know where this is going, but hey, government contracts and internet never goes well. The two don't mix. So so little oversight, so little uh, crossover that you know internet companies love to take advantage of government contracts. It's just the way it is. And we have this article here from TechDirt saying the exact same thing. Saying that, well, in just the last five years or so, AT&T has, uh, has been fined $18.6 million for ripping off programs over the hearing impaired, fined $10.4 million for ripping off a program for low-income families, and fined $105 million for helping crammers by intentionally making such bogus claims uh, I'm sorry, such bogus charges, more difficult to see on customer bills, and then find an additional $60 million for lying to customers about the definition of unlimited data. So altogether, you're looking at eh, somewhere close to uh, 200, yeah, yeah, just about $200 million in complaints against AT&T and their, you know, really their readiness to uh, rip off government, uh, yeah, programs and subsidies. Now, the latest scandal, like the rest of them, won't make any headlines, but it's a bit sad, and although, yeah, I kind of look out for these headlines, you know, ex <laughs> explicitly. Now, uh, a lawyer at at and emerged this week to accuse the telecom giant of systematically uh, ripping off U.S. schools via the FCC's E-Rate program. And when he, uh, when he informed AT&T executives of this, they did nothing, saying that there has been no consequences for a bunch of folks who failed to do what they were supposed to do for a program that was supposed to take care of poor children. And he said, that's what's driving me. These are poor black and brown kids that cannot fend for themselves, and you have to do what's right. And there has to be an accounting. There you go. So let's find out what actually happened. 
Now, the FCC's E-Rates program does a lot of good work by helping shore up communications and broadband access to the nation's school system. Uh, starting, in, starting in 1996, the program paid for a small surcharge on phone bills. Under the program, telecom providers charge what the Telecom Act deems to be the lowest correspondence price uh, and uh, defined as the average that similar, yeah, uh, let's see, defined as the average that similar customers might pay for broadband access, but the FCC has done a somewhat flimsy job at policing the carriers. So essentially what they said, uh, for years, they did not do this and intentionally overcharged school districts for service. And they said, uh, this is, it should be made clear, a very obvious pattern and pops up consistently. That in turn restricted the total number of schools that could have received service, culminating in America being ill-prepared for the COVID crisis. Yeah, more funding. That's really when it comes down to it. The ability to fund and, uh, yeah, you know, do that kind of thing. Very, very important. Now, uh, of course, for a company like AT&T, the thought of helping scammers rip off its own customers, blah, blah, blah. We know that they did wrong. Uh, granted, because AT&T is effectively bone grafted to our intelligence, uh, it never sees much in the way of genuine accountability for anything. Because obviously, AT&T is one of the largest and most successful carriers in the country. And yeah, you know, they also are the ones who are driving that fight against net neutrality and government oversight in so many ways. Uh, you know, they're given all the work. They're given as much as they ask for, as much as they demand, and so little accountability that they're actually providing the services that they promised that they would. So, uh, here you go. Another lawsuit by AT&T potentially ripping off uh, school kids. Not, not a good look. Never a good look. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next story here. And let's see, mental gymnastics, Facebook. Um, this one could be interesting. YouTube. If you didn't know, they have bots. And those bots crawl all over videos and artificially try to recognize, you know, hey, when things are going on, you know, when music is playing in the background, when content is stole, you know, is stolen, uh, you can't just upload, let's say, the entirety of the Avengers and, you know, be able to get away from, uh, you know, get away with it. Uh, bots monitor every part of your video, and if there's any audio, visual, or anything that is copywritten, hey, you know, that's, uh, that's something to kind of take notice of. Which now you enter this story where you have YouTube now testing automatic product detection in videos, saying that they're always running experiments and this latest one testing an automated list of products uh, detected in videos uploaded to the site. As of March 22nd this year, the test is being expanded to uh, people watching videos in the US and there you go. Uh, in one of his blogs, a YouTube representative gave a little more detail about how the feature will be deployed, saying that, quote, we are experimenting with a new feature that displays a list of products detected in some videos. As well as uh, related products, the feature will appear uh, in between the recommended videos to uh, viewers scrolling below the video player. The goal is to help people explore more videos and information about these products on YouTube. Pretty cool, but at the same time, uh, yeah, you know, I'm wondering how accurate it's going to be, and it's further cluttering up the, uh, you know, kind of the user interface. If it detects that, let's say, there's an iPhone laying on a table, is it going to detect that there's an iPhone? and try to give you other videos, you know, explaining what an iPhone is and how to use it. Uh, is that really an effective way? Or is it strictly going to be for, uh, you know, my mind instantly comes back to uh, making money and I can imagine, let's say, a, a particular pattern or a piece of clothing or a sofa, you know, anything that could be in a video 
and a list of them dropping down below saying, hey, you know, did you like the look of that sofa? Well, we can definitely find that for you and you can buy it through a Google recommendation. Uh, that feels a bit more up Google's alley than just strictly finding more information. But there you go. Uh, you know, really, if there was not commercial applications to it, I'm sure that it would not be uh, even experimented on while it happened. Uh, so with that being said, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, just say that presumably it's a move intended to give Google its own piece of the lucrative affiliate link market, which is everything I just said. Uh, mo and with most experiments, it's a little up in the air and we won't know it will happen until it happens. I'm sure accuracy has to be very, very good. So there you go. Pretty simple. Uh, speaking of very, very good, how about very, very bad? And the most invasive app has just been, uh, has just been named and Let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's go ahead and just say that uh, Instagram is that app. Super invasive, takes every little bit, and of course, is a Facebook product. So, no surprise there. Check this one out. Instagram is the most invasive app a new study shows, saying that the Facebook-owned app collects 79% of personal data. It's pretty crazy. Uh, Instagram has topped a list of invasive apps that, uh, yeah, that collect and share user data. And they say that cloud storage firm pCloud, pCloud, there you go, made the discovery after, an, uh, after analyzing the, uh, the recently introduced app privacy labels that companies are now required to include in the app store. The study found that Instagram collects 79% of the user's personal information, including location data, search history, uh, sharing it with third parties, contact info, and financial information as well. They say that any information you agree to, get, uh, you agree to be gathered by an app when signing up uh, can be analyzed for their benefit and even shared. Everything from your browsing history, location, banking details, contact details, fitness levels, can be valued, uh, valuable for app stores to use or, of course, to sell. With over 1 billion, with a B, 1 billion monthly active users, it's worrying that Instagram is a hub for sharing such high amount of unknown user data, but the second worst offender is, well, Facebook, the parent company. Uh, the social network gave away 57% of its users' data to third parties, which can include companies that are associated with that said company. Uh, no surprise there. I mean, the most invasive app, so you have Instagram. I'm surprised that Instagram is not equally as intrusive as other Facebook products, but, uh, you know, actually head and shoulders more so. Uh, I... I would not be surprised if uh, Facebook did that on purpose to try to give themselves a little bit of air of credibility, you know, saying that at Facebook, we don't do that. But at the same time at Instagram, which is owned by the parent company of Facebook, uh, they do that. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, but if you, uh, Instagram is seen as one of those companies that is like, it's Facebook, but it's not really Facebook. I think it has a lot of, uh, it has tons of active users, and a lot of people really do, uh, you know, kind of trust it, I think, a lot more than they do Facebook. So there you go. Okay, uh, that was that story. Now we're going to go ahead and continue on here. Our next story that we're going to do is uh, <laughs> so many to choose from. Well, you know, we could do Facebook to Facebook, and this one has to do more with its augmented reality. If you don't know what augmented reality is, think virtual reality, but in the real world. Overlaying information on the real, uh, yeah, I decided to uh, explain its real world implications. So, uh, here we go. These wristbands that are just so weird, 
are going to be the new uh, tools that they're going to use for uh, their augmented reality. And let's see, so going to have to skip around here a little bit. And by the way, we're actually going to, uh, yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead and go to the source. Uh, this is coming to us from Wired, actually. Uh, actually, I take that back. Wired is, uh, yeah, Wired's being Wired. Okay, no, instead we're going, we're going to go ahead and continue our Technica. And uh, yeah, what these things actually do, let's find out. So it first appeared on March 9th as a tweet on Andrew uh, Bosworth's timeline, the tiny corner of the internet that offers a rare glimpse into the mind of Facebook exec uh, of a Facebook executive these days. And he says that this is the gentleman who leads the augmented and virtual reality research labs. And he shared in a blog post outlining the company's 10 year vision for the future of human computer interactions. Uh, they said then in a follow-up tweet, he shared a photo of an as yet unseen wearable device and Facebook's vision for the future of interacting with computers apparently would involve strapping uh, something that looks like an iPod mini to your wrist. And yeah, it's a multiple iPod minis to your wrist. That's uh, that's a pretty good description for it. Uh, Facebook already owns our social media experience and some of the world's most popular messaging apps. And uh, for better or worse, anytime the company dips into hardware, whether that's a very good VR headset or a mediocre video chatting device that follows your every move, it gets noticed. So what's happening here? They say that, uh, yeah, Facebook, uh, they say that uh, the unanswered question here are less about the hardware itself and more about the research behind it and whether the new interactions Facebook envisions will only deepen our ties to Facebook. You can imagine anything that Facebook does is of course going to try to get you into Facebook's ecosystem even more. Now, this one is an electromyography device. This is what they're calling it, which means that it translates electrical motor nerve signals into digital commands. When it's on your wrist, you can flick your fingers in space to control virtual inputs, whether you're wearing a VR headset or interacting with the real world. You can also train it to sense intent, uh, I'm sorry, intentions of your fingers so that actions happen when your hands are totally still. You can imagine that, you know, you keep your hands totally still, but you're still, you know, kind of flexing your muscles. You're still making that half motion to actually move your fingers. And just that half motion, you know, that very sensitive half motion is enough to do the inputs. Uh, sen being uh, super sensitive in your detection is going to be critical for augmented reality uh, control. You know, you don't want to have to make grand sweeping gestures every time you, you do something. Uh, now, with that being said, all this is tied to, of course, the plans for virtual and augmented reality. And, uh, you know, they have the hand controllers. They have, of course, the mixed reality uh, headset that uh, Microsoft's working on. This is something that many tech companies are seeing, you know, hey, a, a possibility in the next couple of years. And they said that if you really had access to an interface that allowed you to type or use a mouse without actually having to physically use a mouse, you could use this all over the place. And he said that the keyboard is a prime example. He says the wrist computer is just another means of intentional input, except you carry with it everywhere you go. So they're, uh, they are, of course, referring to having no keyboard in front of you, let's say you have a tablet, a phone, whatever, and you have your wrist straps on you, being able to just rest your hands on a table and just start typing if you have the keyboard memorized, one would hope. But yeah, you just start typing and it would act as if you have a fully functional keyboard as an input device. And every keystroke, every everything would be perfectly uh, in sync. Uh, I'm sorry, InSync. I, it's a possibility. Um, you can definitely imagine it. So I'm sure that Facebook is trying to get it done. I'm having reservations, thinking that that's going to be the best way to interact with 
AR and VR. I mean, that's how we interact with our traditional computers. So I can see how being able to bring that form of, uh, you know, that form of input to every other device would be your immediate reaction. But better control in different ways seems to be, you know, uh, probably a better task. Although I will say they are undoubtedly working on voice recognition. They're undoubtedly working on better uh, hand motions and things like that. Uh, hand controllers. It's not just, you know, this is the only thing they're doing to improve these experiences. But yeah, you can see this is where their head's at. So we're going to go ahead and kind of stop right there. The article is actually fairly long, but hey, it's uh, it's pretty cool that Facebook is working on this, and I'm hoping that others uh, follow suit. Yeah, that others follow suit. Uh, okay. This headline, always, uh, always an attention grabber. Zoom, you know, the one that uh, everyone's using. Well, uh, unless you're using WebEx, but still, Zoom, their profits, check this out. Their profits increased 4,000% during the pandemic, but paid no income tax. And you know what? I think I know why, but let's find out exactly. So this news is coming to us uh, from The Independent. And Zoom's pandemic popularity saw the company profits increase by more than 4,000%, yet paid zero federal corporate income tax. And they said that the Zoom video uh, communications made $660 million pre-tax profit in 2020, uh, up from $16 million in 2019. They mentioned that the video conferencing platform was widely used by remote workers and school children, and the immediate shift to online activity explains the company's unprecedented income growth, and for many, Zoom has become ubiquitous with daily meeting space. But why is the company not paid anything? And the main answer appears to be the company's lavish use of executive stock options, which is actually becoming more of a thing. That's why the uh, you know the Blizzard CEO, uh, Bobby Kotick, recently came under fire because he was making so much money, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, while he was at the same time laying people off. You know, yeah, uh, same thing, stock options. Zoom, Zoom's income tax reconciliation says it reduced its worldwide income taxes by $300 million in 2020 using stock-based compensation. So, yeah, if you pay people in stock, that's not technically income, and you don't have to pay taxes on it because it's not actually cash. There you go. Uh, the... Yeah, the ITEP, the ITEP report states that company uh, states that companies uh, that compensate their leaders with stock options can write off for tax purposes huge expenses that far exceed their actual cost. There you go. And then the company appears to have enjoyed tax benefits from accelerated uh, depreciation and research and development tax credits saying that notably combining three tax breaks appear to be the recipe that Amazon and Netflix have used uh, to, yeah, you know, really avoid or reduce paying their tax bill altogether. Don't you wish you could do that? Zoom uh, saying that Zoom complies with all applicable laws, blah, 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 essentially saying uh, what every, you know, uh, rich company that doesn't pay any taxes say. They said that, hey, we're completely legal. And if you don't like it, change the tax law, which, by the way, uh, yeah, that's totally fair. You know, if the tax law is written like that, uh, the government's the government. The government is not a charity. These companies shouldn't have to pay a penny more than uh, they are legally obligated to pay. At the same time, which companies do you think are the most lucrative when it comes to uh, lobbying the government and the people who write the laws to not change them or change them favorably for themselves. That's right, telecommunication and tech companies. They pay incredible amounts, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, which actually is much smaller than the uh, the cash flow. But yeah, they pay millions of dollars to these legislators to get their point across. 
and figure out ways to actually lower their tax bill time and time again. Yep, it's the thing that happens. And by the way, the article wraps up by saying that post-pandemic, as companies evolve once again, we look forward to enabling them to be more efficient, collaborative, and inclusive, creating jobs, strengthening local economies, and helping propel the U.S. recovery. Eh, uh, I'm not mad at them. I'm not mad. Uh, They are paying exactly what they need to pay. Everything seems to be up and up. If there's a loophole as they feel it, if there's an issue as they feel it, uh, yeah, change the law. But it's not Zoom's fault that the tax code is written like that. It's really not. And, uh, you know, giving out stock options and giving out stock seems to be uh, a way to defer the cost, at least for a little bit. Uh, I don't know if the capital gains tax is lower than the, you know, just general high income tax, but yeah, you know, they're not stupid, or at least they may be stupid, but they're not going to hire stupid people to do their taxes for them. And yeah, they're going to find the way to use the least amount of money. Pretty obvious. Okay, Uh, let's go ahead and... Okay, well, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'll cover that one. Uh, Hmm, this ain't good. For months, we have been talking about a, a shortage of chips, of microprocessors in the world. This has led to problems with cars, laptops, consoles, phones, computers, everything being made. Uh, it's a really big issue. Well, looks like there was a fire. And in any one of these major, you know, highly technical, uh, very precious places, any kind of delay is, uh, is really going to be felt. And they said that the, uh, one of the major, uh, one of the car industry's biggest computer chip suppliers has warned that a major fire at one of his factories in Japan would have a massive impact on its ability to fulfill orders. That's an issue. Now, shares in semiconductors firm uh, Renaissance, sure, let's go ahead and go with that, fell uh, along with the clients including Toyota, Nissan, and Honda. Elsewhere, Volkswagen has said that the chip scarcity might last until autumn, and it could go even longer than that. Saying that I think things will get more stable by the fall, but certainly it's going to be complicated and it's going to be challenging, but I think we'll navigate it. That is the Volkswagen's North America chief executive told the BBC. Uh, Now, they said that the blaze occurred last Friday and was caused by plating by a plating tank catching fire as a result of an electrical overcurrent uh, whose cause is still being investigated. It took firefighters more than five hours to put the blaze out. The the fabrication plant involved was in the city of Naka, in the eastern province of Ibaraki. I apologize if I butchered that horribly. But it specializes in making the 300 millimeter wafers, making it one of the company's most advanced facilities. The firm said that there were no human casualties, but 11 of its manufacturing equipment uh, units were damaged. So, I mean, that's good. Um, Yeah, you know, that's good that they didn't uh, hurt anyone, but this is going to hurt the global supply chain significantly. Uh, And because of this, uh, and because this occurred in one of its environmentally controlled clean rooms, which is designed to avoid any dust or other particles from ruining the tiny transistors, Efforts to restart the production will involve more than just swapping out the rune kit, because obviously you have to re-clean that entire room of any debris, smoke, dust, contaminants, everything has to be completely redone. Uh, While they said that the majority of the products manufactured using the affected machines could in theory be manufactured elsewhere, the wider supply shortfall will uh, will make that difficult to achieve. Uh, the company said it hopes to restart production in a month, but they uh, they said that it could take three months before output is back to normal. Pretty crazy. Uh, 
Yeah, so, you know, then it kind of goes into other parts of this whole shortage that we were talking about. And, yeah, just, uh, we're going to leave that there. But Welcome to our oh, guide to the top uh, five actually, most nutrient-laden uh, foods. There we go. Perfect. Pop-ups. Uh, never where you want them. So, let's go ahead and do that. Okay. I'm actually curious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm, you know what? No, we're not going to cover that. Too close to politics. Uh, let's just say that someone's going to be trying to make it back onto the national scene in social media. How that actually happens, who knows? Now, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, see. How about we talk about, hmm, let's see, let's see, let's see. Time? <laughs> Eh, Time Magazine's even getting in on the is even getting in on the NFTs. Check that out. Time Magazine right there, and it looks like they will be selling the cover as an NFT. And they're saying that uh, they are auctioning off three of its iconic covers, saying "Is God Dead?" question mark The 1966 Time Magazine. 2017 is Truth Dead is also up for auction, and they have a brand new cover that is not actually appearing on the magazine is Fiat Dead, a phrase that sounds like catnip to the crypto enthusiast likely to bid on these things. They said that the three covers are selling on the NFT auction super rare with bids running through Wednesday evening. A minimum price of 10 Ether or about $18,000 has been set for each cover. Here you go. Uh, as the format has exploded, brands have been quick to cash in. Taco Bell and Charmin both sold branded NFTs and donated the proceeds. Pringle sold a digital can of chips and Pizza Hut sold digital slices. By the way, I got to see this Taco Bell one. Taco Bell sold an NFT. The future's weird. You know, if you told me now the future was going to be like this, like even a year ago, uh, that we'd all be huddled in our homes and the, uh, you know, grocery delivery would be booming and, you know, Taco Bell would be selling a uh, a little animation that is essentially that transference of force, you know, those clacker balls, uh, but actually tacos. Um, yeah, I would, uh, I would not believe you. Now, with that being said, uh, Taco Bell has hinted that it's planning on doing another run of tokens, but it wouldn't rush to buy in hopes of a gift card. There's no promises that future Taco Bell NFTs will include them. But, yeah, by the way, NFTs, in case anyone, you know, kind of forgot, NFTs are super, super bad for the environment. Just a heads up before you go jumping in on that as well. Uh, okay, so there's that one, reading through these, da, 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 da. I think we're good there. How about, I believe he had to respond to that. How about, um, <laughs> this is a good one. I mean, it's not bad. This one from the BBC. Sometimes I ask people, you know, how do they think the internet, the flow of information gets from one continent to another? Let's say America and Europe. And a lot of times they'll say, well, it's uh, magic or it is satellites or something of that nature. You know, something totally not physical, very mystical kind of way. But no, if you've been a long-time listener of the show, you know very well that the answer are undersea cables, just like you would lay to your house from, you know, from the box in your neighborhood. Uh, but they're much bigger. They're much thicker. And yeah, they just kind of lay across the bottom of the seafloor. Uh, not even the courtesy to tape them down. Nope, just laying there. And that's why you have some instances in the early days of the internet where the entirety of Africa would lose internet because a particular ship disobeyed orders and dropped its anchor and cut the entire continent of Africa's internet cable and then had to go and be repaired multiple times. Uh, well, 
those kinds of uh, mishaps. And uh, yeah, it looks like the new Royal Navy of, uh, of the UK is going to start protecting critical undersea cables, which in my mind is completely fair because that is definitely critical infrastructure. You know, having, uh, you know, it's being able to protect those cables is really paramount and it's uh, very expensive and very time consuming to uh, have any of those cut. Now, obviously, since, you know, these cables were first laid, we now have tons of new ones. In fact, a new Google one just opened up a couple of weeks ago that promised to have a huge throughput uh, from Europe to the United States but they still need to protect it. And now they're hoping to reduce the risk of sabotage, saying that hundreds of thousands of undersea cables circle the globe, providing internet and communications between nations and continents. And now they're worried about risk of sabotage due to submarine warfare, and now the new multi-role ocean surveillance ship will be fitted with advanced sensors and carry a number of remotely operated autonomous undersea drones that will collect data. Essentially, making sure that those cables stay safe and no one messes with them. Super important. Uh, yeah, they say that the lights could go out if we lose our critical national infrastructure across the board. Cables are one part of that critical infrastructure and they're incredibly important. This is, of course, uh, a you know kind of guarding against Russia and the like, and it's uh, yeah probably very very warranted, very very warranted. Uh, let's see. So Prime Minister Boris Johnson has promised his plan for modernizing the armed forces and foreign policy will help uh, will help make the UK match fit. There you go. Um, let's see, he added that I can give you the assurance that you have a record of settlement, blah, blah, blah. Essentially, they're going to get it done. Yeah, they're going to protect those things. And one can certainly hope that they do. Okay, uh, we have time for just like half a story, not even one. Um, you know what, this one should be quick if I'm not mistaken. New York lawmakers. In New York, I think uh, when it comes to police and law enforcement, they're a little hesitant. There have been stories and there's a history there of overreaction by New York law enforcement. And enter the situation here with, you know, I think everyone knows Spot by now, Boston Dynamics dog type robot. And yeah, the police want to start using it. And last I heard, they wanted to use it for, obviously, surveillance, you know, kind of constant surveilling around, uh, uh, you know, around uh, places and parking lots and places like that. And then, of course, they would, uh, you know, they would report back, send video, uh, sound an alert, uh, shine a flashlight on them, stick, you know, stick to a, a, someone trying to steal from cars and things like that. Uh, but they might have crossed the line when I think... I think, uh, let's see, they they wanted to outfit these things with, like, tasers, I think. And by the way, the actual article that they're referring to is this one, uh, a robotic dog used by the police serves privacy concerns, and they had a video where they actually, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, used the robot to chase a person. Not good. Now, a, uh, a New York council member says that he watched in horror last month when the police responded to a hostage situation by using a Boston Dynamics uh, DigiDog, a remotely operated robotic dog equipped with a surveillance camera. And it went viral on Twitter in part due, the, due to their uncanny resemblance with the world-ending machine uh, featured in Black Mirror. Well, uh, he says that I don't think anyone was anticipating that they'd actually be using them in the NYPD right now. Although I would argue, you know, yeah, that's if they're available on the market for like sixty, you know, for sixty thousand dollars, I totally believe that the cops would have access to something like that. But, anyways, 
Uh, they said that the bill would not ban unarmed utility robots like Digidog, only weaponized ro robots. So essentially, if you mount this thing with a, uh, a giant 40 millimeter cannon, yeah, that, that Digidog is probably not going to be allowed on the streets. Uh, I would, I would assume also anything with like tasers, pepper spray, any kind of uh, you know, maybe riot control gear uh, would also be banned. And that's probably a very good thing because these robots could be a good uh, application for that. And yeah, we don't need robots being equipped with weapons to control uh, people. That's... Uh, Let's say that's one thing that still needs a human touch. But uh, yeah, so the, the legislation was introduced, and I can't imagine it uh, not being taken seriously. But everyone, we're about done for today. I want to thank you so much for tuning in to Computer America, and until next time, hey, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we'll catch you then. Everyone, have a great day. Thank you so much. Uh, bye.